to Genesis uh, chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. <coughs> Genesis chapter 32, uh, I'm going to preach a message this morning about a great wrestling match, uh, probably one of the, the uh, greatest that's ever been fought. It wasn't in the WWF or whatever that is, and all of the big goons jumping off the ladders onto somebody else's head, but it was between a man and God, and uh, needless to say, God prevailed. Uh, you'd think that would be just the answer, and you'd be right. And yet it begs the question why so many people are more willing to wrestle with God, with, uh, with God thinking they're going to win when there is no winning against God. And it started with, reading with me, if you would, chapter 32, verse 20. And it's uh, talking about Jacob. He's wrestling with the angel of the Lord. That's an appearance, of, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord. Uh, but God manifests the body there. He's on his way back to meet with uh, his brother Esau and he knows that's going to be a, a scary kind of kind of deal. And in verse 20 it says, And say ye moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, I will appease him. He's hoping to appease his brother with gifts. Uh, and uh, with the present that go before me, and afterward I will see his face, per adventure he will accept. So we went to uh, the present over before us, uh, so went the present over before him, and himself lodged that night in the company, and he rose up that night, took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons, and passed over the ford Jabbok, uh, and he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. Uh, sometimes you, you don't get anywhere with, uh, with the Lord, you don't get anywhere with people until you're just left alone. And that's the curse of today, with uh, radios, televisions, phones that travel everywhere, and you seldom see people without it. It's hard to be alone anymore. It's hard to have a, a quiet time and something isn't going to intrude on that uh, to uh, keep you happy. Verse 24, and Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. That's an interesting kind of idea. What is this wrestling match all about? You think, what a strange way to encounter God. Yeah, it sure is, but uh, do you think God may have a way that he can encounter you and wrestle with you? A way that he can encounter you and stop you from all of your progress, from your fears, maybe from your plans, and bring himself into that? When he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. He wasn't going to quit this wrestling match until he got a blessing from God. You know what we quit? We quit when we think we get what we want, or we just get tired or bored or whatever. He says, I'm going to hang on to this, uh, this until I get exactly what I came for, or what this is all about. I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said to them, What is thy name? As if he didn't know. And he said, Jacob. Jacob means supplanter. Jacob means uh, sort of a schemer. And that's, uh, that's what he was. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. And it's a turning point in a man's life. It's a turning point in the, the makeup of a nation. It's the turning point in the world's history when God begins to refine the, the seed that he's going to bring forth the Messiah from. And he has a wrestling match with this man during this time. Uh, changes his name from Jacob to Israel. That means as a prince. Uh, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. He didn't beat him, but he got his prayer answered. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he, uh, he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he, he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted 
upon his thigh. That halted is, is kind of like, oh. You know, he found out that wrestling match cost him something. And every time he got up to move, every time he walked, every time he went somewhere, it reminded him of that wrestling match. You know what you and I need? We need something that every time we move, every time we think, every time we breathe, it reminds us that God prevailed. He gives us power with him, but we prevail. All right, now that's a pretty good wrestling match, you've got to admit. I have a couple of friends, uh, one of them a preacher that was a, a wrestler, won all kinds of trophies and championships. He's about this tall. A rugged guy, he doesn't, he doesn't look big. Doesn't look, I, I mentioned the other day, I saw a, a thing on the, one of my internet connections the other day, and it was a, a wrestling match. And it's this, this guy, my guess would be he probably was about 260. I mean, muscles bulging out of his shirt, legs, you know, about as big around as a big tree trunk. I just, just big muscular guy. And this, this, Fellow comes in there, he's about this tall, probably a little older than me. And you look at, man, this is going to be a slaughter. This is just so unfair. And you, you kind of cringe it to think how this could possibly work out. And you can see the big guy, he's a little tentative trying to wrestle with this little bitty old man. And that old man, is, he kind of grabs a hold of him and he, it's kind of like looking up at a tree and holding that tree, and just they're wrestling around, they're wrestling around, and that guy, the big guy starts pushing him, he's just literally pushing him across the, across the floor there, and the next thing you know, that big guy's on the floor, and that old guy's got him around the, got him in a chokehold around the throat, and the guy's tapping, he's about to pass out. You think, wow, if you know how to wrestle, it's a big advantage. And it doesn't matter how big somebody is. Anybody know who the Gracies are? These are some of the world's best wrestlers. They take these martial artists, they take these, uh, uh, these uh, boxers, they take all, they don't care who they are, how big they are. These guys will take down every single one of them. I don't, I don't know if they've ever been beat, but if they have, it's, a, it's an extreme rarity, and it's got to be just a lucky punch. There's something about wrestling that once something gets a hold of you, if they're proficient at it, your chances of getting away are pretty slim. Well, I want to I preach to you about another kind of wrestling match that you and I are in, whether you want to be or not. It's not of your choice. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that you said that every one of your children is going to be a wrestler. God, you said that every one of your children, your design for them is to be trained up and able to win so that they can take a fall without being hurt, so that they can uh, deal with the enemy without fear of conquest. And I pray today, God, that uh, as this message is preached, that your blessing would be upon it. Your Holy Spirit would speak to hearts and lives. And pray, God, today that we leave your changed people, Lord, with a greater confidence and the ability of our God to go before us and not send gifts to men. You've sent us the greatest gift ever, eternal life. You've sent us a gift of your Holy Spirit to give us power and courage and strength and wisdom and knowledge. And I pray, God, we'd be well practiced in the use of all of your gifts. Lord, bless today as only you could. Bless our Sunday school and our, our children. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 6, if you please. Some of you might have guessed that already. I'm going to read you something while you're, you're finding that. I, I picked this out of my notes. It's, it's from a few years ago, and I suspect it's, it's uh, probably about the similar, but it's a Gallup poll. And it says this. It says, uh, three in ten Americans interpret the Bible literally. Anybody believe that? There's, uh, there's 330 million people in America, give or take 40 million a week. 110 million people take the Bible literally? I'm not sure I believe that. <laughs> I, I think if you could get 10 million, you'd probably be stretching the mark. But anyway, uh, it says uh, there are 10 million uh, Americans that interpret the Bible literally, saying it is actually the Word of God. Well, saying and believing is two different things. 
That's similar to what Gallup had measured over the last two decades, but down from the 70s and the 80s. A 49% plurality of Americans say the Bible is the inspired word of God, but that it should not be taken literally. So here's something people uh, don't believe you should believe literally what it says. I, I'm not sure what you should believe. Consistently, the most common view in Gallup's nearly 40-year history is this question. Another 17% consider the Bible an ancient book of stories recorded by man. I think that's what most churches do. So. These results are based on a Gallup poll. The high point in the percentage of Americans favoring a literal interpretation of the Bible is 40% recorded in 80 and 84. The low point was 27% in 2001. That's 20 years later. It's, uh, it's on a, a death slide to zero. Among the most uh, major U.S. subgroups, a plurality or a majority holds the view that the Bible is the inspired word of God uh, rather than the actual words of God or the book of fables, legends, history, moral precepts. Highly religious Americans and those who have less formal occasion, uh, education are exceptions to this general So. The less educated you are, the more Bible you're likely to believe. That sounds intimidating, doesn't it? Well, the old expression a friend of mine used to say is some people are educated far beyond their intelligence. 54% of those who attend religious services on a weekly basis believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. So half the people that go to church believe the Bible. Well, what happened to the 110,000? I think people are very confused in their answers. Uh, belief in the literal interpreta interpretation of the Bible declines as educational attainment increases. 46% of Americans with a high school education or less take the Bible literally compared with no more than 22% of Americans with at least some college education. The majority of Americans with at least some education, college education, believe the Bible to be inspired. Gallup has consistently found strong differences in views of the Bible as the actual word of God by religiosity and education. The current poll also finds significant income difference, with 50% of the lower income respondents believing the Bible is the actual word of God, compared to 27% of middle income and 15% of high income respondents. It also would indicate that the more money you have, the less you have a belief in God, uh, I believe that's just exactly what Jesus said. It, uh, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So, so far, all they proved is the Bible is true. Uh, Protestants most divided in interpret interpretation of the Bible is because they'll be always to use it. <laughs> Nobody else has a clue. Protestants, including, including those who identify themselves as Christian, but not Catholic or Mormon, are the most likely religious group to believe the Bible is literally true. 41% of Protestants hold this view, and a slightly larger 46% take the Bible to be the inspired word of God. Two-thirds of Catholics believe the Bible to be inspired word of God. I, I would add in a uh, bracket note, that, although they have no idea what it actually says. While 63% of those without religious affiliation think the Bible is not the word of God at all. Others are too small to even count. Belief in a literal interpretation of the Bible is especially pronounced among church-going Protestants as two-thirds of Protestants who attend church weekly hold this view. Conservatives and Republicans more likely to take the Bible literally. And I thought this was kind of not telling, but it should be obvious. Given the strong link between religion and politics in the U.S., it is not surprising that the views of the Bible vary by party identification and ideology. The poll finds that 42% of Republicans compared to 23% of independents and 27% of Democrats say the Bible is literally true. Conservatives are more likely than moderates and liberals to believe in a liberal interpretation of the Bible. Uh, these, these numbers are constantly going down, and the only ones that go up are the people that reject the Bible as the words of the living God. And uh, what you find out is, is the whole of this world tends towards unbelief in truth. It tends towards agnosticism. It tends towards doubt. 
and tends towards rejection of God's truth. The reason for that being that the devil is the prince of this world. The reason is, is that the educational systems of this country are so, uh, so caught up in an intellectual sophistry that words don't seem to mean much anymore. Uh, how can 62% how can believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, but you couldn't come up with probably 5% of America that saved? The Bible says you must be born again, except a man repent, he can in no wise enter the kingdom of God. So you, you realize these people, uh, the, the polls mean absolutely nothing. The educational system is one of a dumbing down, not of a building up. And I, I present to you this, that the brightest people are those people who both hold a literal view of the Bible and have managed to get a good education without having their faith in God destroyed. They are also a very small minority. Having said all that, look at your Bible, if you would, please. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, well, I thought we'd never get there. <laughs> Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. We'll get into what we're going to stand by here in just a minute. I just wanted to approach this thing from a, a, a battle perspective. So we had some battle songs. We had some things about uh, who believes what, how they believe it. And also uh, a testimony from a, a man in the Philippines talking about the culture is, is insignificant. Everywhere you go that the Bible and the Word of God comes forth, there is a, a, uh, a wave of opposition that comes against it at every level, at every part, whether it's political, spiritual, religious, uh, educational, economic. It's against belief. It's against truth. Uh, as we raise our children, our families, we need to be mindful of the fact that our children are going to be assaulted on every side by every level of satanic belief, every level, level of atheistic uh, uh, compromise and uh, so-called logic uh, to the point where they're not able to be, have the capacity to think or reason anything rationally anymore. We are approaching the Orwellian sphere of a lie is the truth, and the truth is a lie, and the government is right about everything, and history is only as good as the last issue of the government propaganda that you read, where you can't believe anything. I am so thankful that we have the, uh, the unfailing, unassailable word of the living God as our banner of truth, as our anchor of hope, as our uh, fortress of uh, resistance to all of these things, the more we avail ourselves of it, and apprise ourselves of the very words that God has, has preserved so, so faultlessly for us, we will find ourselves able and uh, capable of wrestling. Amen. Now, let me just touch a couple things here. Our contest is not against flesh and blood. It means that natural strength will not work. Uh, I've seen people that take this to the point where they're going to sit down in a dark room and do nothing because they're just going to trust God. But like the people of Israel, God told them, every place that the sole of your foot treads, I will give it to you. The implication was, you've got to prepare yourself for battle and go out, or God can't give you victory. Faith is not doing nothing. Faith is fighting on God's terms, under God's banner. It's doing things God's way. It is never a, uh, a, a movement of inertia, whereby you're, you can't move and there's nothing going to move you. Is get moving and trust the Lord. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. There are people today, I get them all the time, come join us in a protest against this sin or against that sin or against that. Listen, I'm against all the sins, but God never told us to go protest any of those things. He said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. For the time will come when they will not receive uh, sound, doc uh, sound doctrine, but will heap themselves teachers having itching ears. 
We need to be ready with the Bible. We need to be ready with the power of God's word to pull down the, uh, the protections, the self-defenses of our enemies. It is God's battle, not ours. It also needs to be as a teamwork. Paul writes by the inspiration of God, finally, my brethren, be strong in the power of the Lord and his might. It says in uh, we, verse 12, wrestle not. It is not a matter of the preacher's job. It is not a matter of the deacon's job. It is not a matter of the super spiritual uh, people of the church's job. It is a matter of we believers, we Christians, we people who trusted in Christ to be prepared and ready for this battle, for this great wrestling match, uh, whereby our, our families and our futures and our fortunes are tied up in this world. It is not a battle against every man. It's a battle against the devil and all of his influences. They take on the forces of men. It takes on the power of government. It takes on the, uh, the covering of education. Today, what people want to cover up their biblical ignorance is, is their, with their sheepskin. It didn't occur to them that God covered up Adam and Eve with a sheepskin, but it required the blood sacrifice of that animal to get knowledge of how they wanted to live for God and what God was going to do after that. Today, people get a college education and think, I can throw the Bible away now. I'm too smart for that. You've outsmarted yourself, my friend. You've cut your own throat. You've hung yourself with your own rope. The idea that a team is involved, a group is involved, it's the whole body of Christ, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, who's uh, involved in this. If you're saved, that is you. The other poem about, for the one of a shoe, a horse, a, a horse was lost, for one of a horse, a rider was lost, for one of a rider, the, uh, the sword was lost, for one of the sword, the battle was lost. Well, you don't need me, and well, it's a small church. It's, listen. God has a place on the battle lines of this world for every single individual. I'm not talking about a fist fight with somebody that doesn't believe what you believe, and I'm not talking about arguing with everyone, but there is a place in the, the sphere of God's battle for every single believer, whether it's on their knees in prayer, diligently, purposefully, is the, uh, uh, the, the factory workers that loaded the ammunition for World War II and uh, loaded the bullets and the uh, built the, the rifles and stuff. There are people to support all those things as the taxpayers did. There's places where you have frontline shock troops. There's places where you have supply groups. There's something for everyone in the economy of God to do a work that is wrestling against uh, not flesh and blood, but against the enemies of God and of God's people. Today people take this attitude, I'll go to church, but don't expect any more out of me. God does. It isn't a matter of what the preacher expects. It's not even a matter of what the rest of the church expects. God expects you to wrestle against the powers of the darkness of this world. God expects you to armor up, buckle up, get ready for the battle because it's coming. Is the, uh, the propaganda machine spin up? Is the enemies of God spin up? Uh, you see people over in, uh, in China being in prison for no more than going to church. No more for not accepting the government propaganda about a state church. You see people around the world, they finally admitted that publicly, it'll probably never be on the Communist, Net, Communist News Network or any of the other uh, mafia-controlled uh, networks, that the largest uh, persecuted minority on the face of this world are Christians. It's not black people, it's not Muslims, it's not anybody else, it's Christians. On average, 10 Christians a day are murdered for no other reason than they believe in the Bible, they believe in Jesus Christ. No team can afford argument and friction among its members. That may be <coughs> locker room stuff. When I was in the Navy, we always had uh, uh, little scuffles and fights. And if you get on a uh, submarine tender where the, the skimmers are, there's always a bit of a conflict there, but I tell you what, you let a shot be fired in battle, we're all on the same team. Mm -hmm. That, that either department rivalry, uh, when my brother Ray was here, we had a bunch of Coast Guard uh, guys at one time. That's all fun and gays. We can laugh about, uh, I used to joke with them. I said, yeah, I think you got to be over six feet tall to be in the Coast Guard, don't you? And the guy said, well, why do you think that? I said, well, in case the cutter sinks, you got to be able to walk to shore. They're just jokes. They just make fun of those things. But 
let a shot be fired, we're all on the same side. You know what? We can never get a church like that and be a force to be reckoned with, wouldn't it? Amen. Amen. I think we're heading here. I'm trusting that as the, uh, as the darkness dawns and the, and the lights go out around the world, that those people have recognized the dangers of the day, the enemy of before us, and the God that's above us. You've got to give us the victory. We'll band together like never before. Amen. That Bible says in Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Boy, that's, that's good relations. That's, that's good team morale. That's good team spirit. That's fighting together and praying for one another, helping one another, encouraging one another, not being nitpicky or, or uh, all that kind of business. If you want to the enemy is the devil, the hordes of the devil. The world's uh, not our enemy, but the world is subject to the devil, and there will be things in it that are unacceptable to us. Look with me in uh, 2 Corinthians. Save your place in Ephesians. We'll be back in a minute. In 2 Corinthians, Chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And it says this. Unless you think Pastor Smith is making this stuff up. Paul says, uh, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. It's not a matter of beating people up. Peter Cartwright, anybody ever hear of him? Old time Methodist preacher back when the Methodist churches believed something. He got converted. He's a blacksmith by trade. And if you ever seen any of them guys, you've got to be pretty rugged to swing a hammer in a hot forge all day long, and pounding that steel and shaping that stuff. He uh, went to a guy's house one time and the guy started picking a fight with him, mocking God and all that kind of. Peter Cartwright beat that guy into submission. Hey, what did he do that for? Well, he didn't want to get beat up. I mean, it's sort of self-defense. But he wasn't going to let that guy up until he called on Jesus Christ to save him. He said, well, that's not the way to do it. No, I don't think that's the way to do it. I, I don't think that's a great way to do it. But that guy did. The guy became a good church member. You know what he realized? All of his muscle weren't going to save him. All of his power couldn't deliver him from the preacher. Peter Cartwright went to a dance one time. He said, the preacher goes in there, everybody's dancing around. You know, back in those days, it was kind of like a saloon, bar, town hall kind of meeting place. And a, a young woman sees this great big hulk of a guy standing on the sidelines there, and he's just kind of watching him. She ran up and grabbed him by the hand, pulled him out to the middle of the floor. He let her out there. He grabs her hand. And she's trying to dance, and he's just standing there. He raises his hand and starts preaching. Say, well, he put on quite a show. Yeah, he put on quite a spectacle. He didn't stop preaching until some people got saved. Can you imagine that today? Yeah. The average preacher don't have enough nerve to walk out on the sidewalk with a, with a sign. Amen. The average Christian today won't carry a Bible in public. The average Christian today won't go stand on the street corner and tell them why they get saved. They're scared half to death to give somebody a gospel track in a store. What a, what a world we've come to. Now listen, I, I'm not recommending the Peter Cartwright School of, of Evangelism. What I am rec recognizing is the boldness that man took to do whatever it took to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ in mercy to them. It's not a kindness to be silent to lost people. It is not a kindness to cater to false doctrine so people could die believing that and go to hell. That is our mercy is to reach out there and fight with the devil, with God's enemies, bringing them the truth. It's not carnal weapons. We walk in the flesh. We don't war in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not physical things, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You realize that what God's talking about there is keeping your mind under His control. You know something? When you start thinking like a Christian, when you start talking like a Christian, when you start living like a Christian, you'll have fulfilled what God wants for a Christian. 
It is not some special calling. The average person today never learns the Bible because they don't want to put any effort into it. They, they want to come to church. They want the preacher to preach a flowery message, make them feel good, send them home with a little, oh, I feel so wonderful. I'm just so happy. I'm... I hope you leave that way. But you know how I hope you really leave? Charged up about, I can't wait to tell somebody what it means to be saved. I can't wait to open the Bible to my family members that are lost and show them what it means to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. That everlasting confidence that comes from calling upon the Lord Jesus Christ and having Him give you everlasting life. This, uh, this gift of God, the Bible says some interesting things about here. About it. In Job chapter 40, the Bible says only He that made Him can cause His sword to approach unto Him. You know, it's talking about Job uh, chapter 40 and 41. It's talking about the devil. And it uses the analogy of the behemoth and the leviathan and that kind of business. But clearly, any animal in this world can be approached by men and killed, can be taken. Am I right? I mean, don't men harpoon whales? Oh, yeah. don't, don't Native Americans, uh, Native people around the world, kill crocodiles and hippopotamuses and all that kind of business. So if you believe the Bible, you've got to jump right to the to the one who's the king over all the children of pride, the devil, and say, that's the one that's our enemy. That's the one that God can cause. You know what that Bible says? It says in, in uh, Jeremiah 48.10, it says in this book right here, it says, Cursed be he that causes this sword to be held back from the blood. Well, I just don't like to think about that. I don't want to fight. I don't... You know what this is for? This is for bringing truth. It is an offensive weapon. It is a defensive weapon. But it's the only weapon that you and I have. Everything else that God gives us is for protection. This is by the means by which we take ground. This is the means whereby we train so that those other uh, implements that God has given us take on effect in our life. You know what the problem is today? 110 million people don't believe this book. Probably 10 million people in America don't believe this book. Or if they do, they don't have any idea what it says. You think on any given Saturday, Friday, Wednesday night, you can find 10 million people praising God for an infallible book? You can't even find that in churches, let alone just people in general. Let's look at what this thing says. It's not with carnal weapons. It's not with our strength physically. It's not with our impressive campus. We have a church of campus. We have a campus. We have a church. If you have a campus, you got a little training center for little nursery school girls. You have one where you go and send the kiddies to, to be trained in something. I don't know what you want. On that back, back wall was a banner up there. We carried that in some parades. And it says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That banner does not say thy word was truth. That Bible doesn't say some of the some of what purports to be the Bible is truth. Thy word is truth. As Brother Howie said, the very words that are found in that King James Bible are the words of the living God preserved faultlessly, infallibly for us upon whom the ends of the world will come. Our good nature, our good fortune, our good blessings from the Lord is to take those words, put them deep into our heart so that nothing that anybody says can be offensive to us. A guy said something the other day, and he says, I hope that didn't offend you. I says, you ain't got a prayer. If you think you're going to offend me, I don't know what you'd even say. I, I've had some things said to me that, uh, did you get mad? Well, I, I wasn't happy about it, but I don't find it offensive. I find that somebody, people, somebody says something stupid, can't you feel sorry for them? They don't know any better than that. That's the majority of people you're going to deal with. Amen. They deserve your pity. They deserve your sorrow to their, to their spiritual welfare. Amen. Then help them. Help them overcome their education. Help them overcome the strengths that they see in their life. Just like Jacob, wrestle with God until he just takes you to the ground. Wrestle with Peter Cartwright until you realize if a man could do that to me, what would God do to me for ignoring his word? And then trust the living God and be glad now he's on your side and you're on his. There's some things about this, uh, uh, this uh, battle that we're in. It says in verse uh, 13, 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. You realize that most people don't ever take unto them the whole armor of God? You remember when David was given Saul's armor? He took it out there to try it. I don't know about you, but if you're going to go to battle with a giant, it better not be your first round of trying that stuff on. You better be practiced at whatever it is. David finally says, I'll trust this slingshot I've used over and over and over again, as opposed to that, man, that elaborate, fancy-looking armor that the king wore. The king don't even trust it. He won't go out there in it. What do you make him think I want to do it? Here's what he says. And that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. There's some doing. I talked about inertia before. Everybody know what inertia is? Inertia is a law of physics. It has two parts. The one that you typically think of, I suspect, is the one where it says a body in motion will remain in motion until it's acted upon by another force that, that stops it or ceases its motion. The other one is the law of, iner of uh, inertia. It says a body at rest will stay at rest until it's acted by a greater force. So the average Christian lays inert, not moving, until God comes along and puts a, whatever size shoe God wears, whatever place he thinks is most appropriate, to get you moving. Pray that it doesn't come to that. Some people do that after a loved one dies. Some people do that after they've seen their fortunes go. Some people do that after they've seen their kids slide off the road from good kids to drug addicts and prostitutes. Some of them even became politicians. Hmm. Be careful. I have no idea where this world's going to take you or your family. Be prepared by the word Dress up. Stand therefore, verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth. You know what Jesus said? I've given them thy word, and thy word, the world hath hated them. Why in the world would the world hate you? The world hate you for believing a book. Because when you believe that book, it changes you. Listen, this idea of you could get saved, it won't, it won't interfere with your life. If you could get a salvation that didn't interfere with your life, you got a salvation that didn't interfere with your eternity either. It didn't make a bit of difference. You're dreaming. That Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Is. Are you? Did it change your life? Did it change your purpose? Did it change your thinking? Change your priorities? Change your interests? This uh, loins girt about with truth. You know what your loins are? Your loins are this part of you right in here. That's pretty much the strongest part of your body. Those upper thighs and your stomach muscles. When you're really in bad shape, you have abs. You'll never find them, but they're in there somewhere. That allows you to move. That allows you to carry things. That allows you to bend, flex, stretch, and run, and do things. Spiritually, there's an application for that. Have your loins girt about with truth. This girdle is what fastens everything else of your armor that you wear. Uh, you see a, a soldier with a utility belt on there. They hang ammo on there. They hang canteens on there, a knife on there. They've got uh, radios, all kinds of equipment on there. What happens if they're just flopping down the road and all this stuff is flopping all over the place? You've got to have it tight to you so that it's not going to be lost. Have your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. This breastplate was that armor plate. If you see a Roman soldier, you see that sort of a formed thing that goes over his chest that protects your heart. You're, you know, you want to kill somebody? All you got to do is puncture both lungs. They're as good as dead. I can't breathe. You don't have to have another mark on. Do it with a pencil. You don't have to have another mark on. You want to go deer hunting? You want to make sure you kill a deer? Double lung shot, thing's dead. You don't know it's dead yet. 
It can run two, three hundred yards, but it's dead. You know what the problem is today? A lot of people are dead and don't know. No right, no breath, breastplate righteousness. Not only that, but their heart is open and exposed to it. You know your heart, we use it as uh, today kind of a, in February, we give your heart to somebody. You want to tell somebody the issues of your heart? The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it you perceive the issues of life. When you open your heart up and it's not protected by righteousness, it allows everything in the world to come in there. And the next thing you know, you're all enamored with football stars and basketball stars and movie stars. And the preacher is just that old man that stands up there and rants and raves trying to get you to think differently than you're doing. And after all, he doesn't have any money and he's not known around the world. My name's in heaven. Amen. Anybody think LeBron James got his name in heaven? I don't think so. I hope I'm wrong. I don't think so. Big football players, if, if their name's in heaven, they'll tell you it's in heaven. And then the team will get mad. You better make sure where your heart is. Make sure it's covered with the righteousness of God. That, that's that shield that doesn't let anything else in there to interfere with what God's trying to do in us. It doesn't keep allowing the world to dilute God's truth. You know that the reality is, in about uh, 20 minutes, everybody's going to walk out that front door. And you're either going to walk out with your ears and your heart and your mind and your spirit filled with God's word from the last hour and a half, two hours, if you, if you manage to get up for Sunday school. You're going to head out that door, and I'm not going to see you again until Wednesday. Maybe. Or maybe next Sunday. How many times are you going to eat during that week? Well, three times a day, that's 27 meals. So you think spiritually you can make it on one little lunch, but you can make it through the week on 27 meals. There's some kind of imbalance in that, folks. You're going to have to take that strength out there. You're going to have to begin applying it and relive it, review it, on and on and on. This blessed breastplate of righteousness, we need to keep our morale high. We need to make sure our hearts are covered. The Bible goes on to say, uh, verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Did you ever see anybody out walking in the woods with high heel shoes on? <laughs> well, that sounds stupid. Yes, it probably is, but I, I bet somebody did it. You know why? Because although they want to be out there, they still want to look really nice. Stylish. You know what God has? God has a, a style of equipment that is service oriented. It's not a matter of the, the whims of the world. The, the uh, desires of the, of the, what are the masses requiring? God says, get something on there that will carry your feet over rough ground. Get something out there that will protect your toes, keep them from getting stepped on. People do it. I bet you, I bet you there's 10 seats in this, this room right here today that are empty for no other reason than somebody stepped on their toes. I know, not literally, but I hope you're getting you know something that if you put God's word in there, it's just great peace and they can love thy law and nothing except the preacher. Or that, that person looked away when I, when I came in the room. It ain't all about you. We're here because it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't we? I mean, I, I thought that's why you're here. That's why I'm here. Amen. Feet shod with the preparation, preparation of gospel of peace. Ready to stand on firm ground. David wrote in the Psalms about God keeping his feet and they didn't slide. When I was in the Navy, I got a pair of shoes they issued to us. And we were an experimental company, I guess. And I got these shoes. And when we had to go on service week, uh, you're working in the galley and you're working in this place and that place. And those shoes I had, I'm telling you what, I, they must have been made by an ice skating company. You couldn't stand on anything without slipping and sliding on those things, and I hated them, but there was no opportunity 
to exchange them for anything, I was stuck with them. Man, the, one of the first things I did when I got out of Brooklyn, I bought me some decent shoes. You know what some people think? Well, these are the shoes I came with. They are just the way I am. Well, then fall on your face. You might know the rough, rough roads you might be traveling. You might know how steep the road might be before you get to the water. You might even know how deep the waters might be. You need what God gives you, not what you choose. Get yourself prepared. Also, it says it goes on, it doesn't leave us there. Feed Sean with the preparation of gospel peace. And above all, as if this is the most important, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, a shield is something that is movable. You've got a breastplate of righteousness, but a shield is something normally you put it on your on your left hand, so you, unless you're left-handed, then you get your sword in. I watched something the other day, and they had a shield that had a, it was kind of arched at the top, and had a cutout in the, in the bottom of it. Anybody know what that was for? Let's say you could pull that sword out, lay that sword right over the top of your shield, and you could ch literally charge somebody like a battering ram. And while they're flailing with that sword, you could put that your sword in them. So I don't want to hurt anybody. I'm trying to get a grip on the right folks. We're not talking about carnal things. We're talking about spiritually. And God says, that sword of the Spirit we're going to deal with here in just a second. You've got to have a shield, but you've got to have a shield that will allow that sword to work. Because you can, you can defend yourself all day long. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. If you can defend yourself against a man with a shield, because that shield is movable, how do you defend yourself against two men if you have a shield? You know why most most problems in churches come from the back? No armor. There's no armor in your back. God assumes you're going to face things. God assumes you're going to charge ahead. God assumes it's forward march to victory. Not retreat. Not running back. Not turning your back on your responsibilities. Because one of the things on that battle line, we talked about we, Every man is the defense of his neighbor. Every man is the defense of his brother. Every man is the defense of that man's family. We, are, we advance as a, as a group. We win as a group. We lose as a group. But we stick together. This idea of the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Well, the devil is not trying to shoot you in the foot, but if that will distract you enough, he will. You know, most people are not capable of dealing with two issues at a time. And I don't say that with anything other than just a, an observation. So if you get caught up in one thing, all the devil has to do is uh, send the other guy over there, and you're in trouble. You better have somebody else that's willing to come to your aid. Remember I asked you about the two men? You got one shield and two men? You better hope you got somebody that can be more back. You remember in... Uh, in uh, Jeremiah, I believe it is, where God said that he would be your real reward. That real reward, the reward, reward is somebody that keeps the watch. He's going to watch your back. That ought to be us, watching for one another, helping one another. This shield of faith, a lot of people have a shield of faith. The problem with the shield of faith is only this. It's not meant to be an offensive weapon. So you don't get anywhere with it. You can keep yourself safe. You can't help anybody else with it generally. It only is good for you. Uh, but it goes on. This shield of faith, by the way, is something that you can put up over your ears. You might know who Tokyo Rose was. That's a long ways back. Tokyo Rose was a, a woman that spoke very good English. She was Japanese. And she got on the radio. And she... she uh, broadcast 
to the American troops. Hey, Yank, your family forgot about you. Hey, Yank, your girlfriend is running around with some other man. Hey, Yank, your government doesn't care anything about you. Hey, Yank, you're losing the battle. You're losing the war. When you start listening to the enemy's cat calls, when you start listening to what the enemy says, other than the one that's given you the victory, even our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, you're headed for a defeat because it demoralizes you. The average person that stays out of church never gets anything to encourage their faith, never gets anything to, uh, to strengthen that shield, never gets anything to furbish that, short, that sword or to do anything else for them. They're just at the whim of the enemy. That shield of faith, Jeremiah was, uh, said that he was weakening the nations because he told them what was going to happen. And I've had a, a guy a couple of weeks ago down in Mystic says, well, you know, I think you'd have a better, better effect if you just were more positive. That's what they told Jeremiah. He says, you're, you're weakening the hands of the men of war by telling them that we should just kind of surrender to the king of Babylon and go with them. He said, I'm not weakening your hands. I'm just telling you what God said. If you fight against it, you're going to be dead. He's going to kill you. Oh, we don't believe that. We just, you know, we've got a philosophy about this. Everybody does. All philosophers die by their philosophy. In verse uh, 16, above all, take the shield of faith, whereby you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation. There's one more and there's two more hands. The helmet of salvation. What does a helmet cover? Anybody got a, some of you military strategists? Yeah, a head. Somebody, somebody got it. You get on there, because this is, this is where the seat of direction comes from. This is where power is. This is where instruction and direction comes from. You know what? You protect that. Your, your, your thoughts are about, you know what the most dangerous thing that happens in battle? And I've read about this. I couldn't tell you how many times. Between the noise, the, the terror, the gunfire, the smoke, the smells, dead people, all that kind of stuff, people just, they just kind of flip out. They lose the capacity to reason. You're almost dead because you don't have any sense left of what to do. All your training is gone by the wayside. What we need to do as Christians is to make sure that helmet of salvation is on. If you're saved, you, God gave you one. Don't try and lift it off. Keep your head covered. Keep your thoughts right. Keep your, your plan together. If you ever lose that, you're really in a bad, a bad way to go. We need to have a sound mind renewed by Scripture. I, I'm going to ask, ask for an opinion. Don't give me a show of hands because I don't want anybody to be embarrassed. How many of you have an active Bible memorization plan going? Answer yourself. And if not, ask you, why not? That Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I sin not against thee. The implication being plain and serious, if you're not memorizing the Bible and filling your head as well as your heart up with the Bible, you're just taunting God to put something in your pathway that's going to draw you to something. Be very careful. Get that Bible down. Say, well, preacher, I got a problems with this. I can't remember anything. I bet I could challenge that fairly well. I'm going to let you delude yourself if that's what you're thinking. Because if you can't, you're just not working hard enough at it. Stick with it. Repetition. The guy told me, I wish I could remember the Bible like that. Well, if you've read it 50 times, you probably could. If you've memorized that verse and gone over it 50 times, sometimes in a week, sometimes in a, in a day, you will. Well, I, I just, uh, yeah, you don't want to put that much effort into it. It all comes down to how sincere, how serious are you about this wrestling match? Do you want to win? Or do you just want to hope that the enemy lets you up and gets you done? You know, in real wrestling, 
referee says, that's it. You know what, in real life, and the enemy don't care. He's not your friend. We come down to the sword of the spirit. It's not the most important, but boy, it's in the middle. All of these things are the whole armor of God. One without the other is ineffectual. A great sword without a shield or without a helmet still leaves you vulnerable. But for the average Christian today, what you need is take that sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's the only thing God gave you to fight with the enemy. Everything else is for cover. Everything else is for your protection. Everything else is for your personal benefit. And everybody loves that. This is how you deliver your family. This is how you deliver to the friends. This is how you challenge the enemy and the ground that he's trying to take from you. Today, the average church doesn't have a Bible. It doesn't have a sword. It has sort of a rubber noodle that just... And if it were not so deadly, it'd be comical. Mm -hmm. But they've disarmed the population. The, the so-called professing world has done what the devil couldn't do. Taking away God's strength and power. So they're trying to protect themselves with something that has no edge. And it really has no point. But it won't hurt you. Cursed be he to keep it back his sword from blood. Well, I just don't like what you're saying. I don't like going out. I don't like doing this. Didn't Jesus call his disciples? He said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't ask him. Uh, I'm taking a poll here. Uh, Peter, do you like witnessing to people? Peter, do you like telling people how wrong they are about their religion? I want to point out something that's true to them. John, what do you think about uh, uh, telling the, the Pharisees that they're wrong about this? Uh, Matthew, what do you think about this? Do you, you think you should tell people that, that uh, they're making the commandments of God in none effect by their tradition? He didn't do that. He said, follow me. This is what I will make you. Today people fight, kick, scream. The sword of the Spirit. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Wednesday night, we have prayer meeting. I've had people say, well, I, I can pray at home. Sure you could, but you won't. <laughs> sure you could, but you won't know what's going on. You know what prayer meeting is about? It isn't about you. It's about you taking your part. You taking your place and praying for prayers and supplication for all saints, not just you, not just the people you know, but hearing about that little baby that Muriel mentioned, hearing about Brother John Sarah over in Zambia, Africa, uh, going through all kind of health crisis and issues there, uh, the church in China going through uh, just persecution upon persecution. Listen, if what's going on in the mission world does not influence you politically, how you think about politics, you better smarten up. Because yeah. what our government is allowing to go on around the world is pretty soon what's going to be going on here. That's right. You think, well, we should let Apple and we should let uh, uh, Google and all uh, do all this stuff and, and watch over the, the population. And, and uh, Apple. What do you think that is? That's a test ground. They're just practicing there. Right here's where the mother load is. Right here's where the money is. Right here's where the influence is. And if somebody don't speak up against all of these things and their freedom, they all impinge on the freedom. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If you get rid of the Spirit of the Lord, there's no liberty at all. Yeah. Prayer. Constant prayer. You need to pray about principalities and powers. I'm going to have to hurry here, but I just want to mention this. Behind the world scenes, and I, we're, we're halfway through the message, but I'm just going to end it. Behind the world scenes are things going on 
that I think this, the so-called scientific world is just beginning to get a glimmer of. And they talk about how behind and backwards the Bible is. In Daniel chapter 10, uh, Daniel had prayed. And God said, I sent, I sent the angel there for you three weeks ago, but he had to fight with the prince of Persia to get there. He said, well, man, one angel killed the whole Assyrian army. How in the world is the king of Persia going to keep back behind every throne, behind every government, is some angelic power? I don't have any idea how that works. All I know is it's true. That's where the word prince comes from, or principality comes from, the prince. He's ruling over a uh, subject, playing mass for another king. Well, the devil is the god of this world, but he has dominions and principalities and powers behind all these things. And when the Bible says righteousness exalteth the nation, where do you think that leaves America? 60 million babies butchered, poisoned, burned. Where do you think that leaves America with a, with a pervert pedophile running for president? Yeah. Where do you think that leads, leads in America with people thinking that abortion is a human right and it's a, a woman's right over her own body? Listen, every woman's got the right over her own body. That ain't your body. They ain't selling your body parts. They're selling your baby's body parts. Don't be so stupid. Don't be so naive. Don't be so accepting of this world's baloney. It's all run by the devil. We need to make, make sure that we're uh, aware of that, that there's some prayer needs to be going on for our country. Amen. I had people get up and leave. Preacher, you talk about politics too much. How many people think the money you earn is ought to be yours? Weird. Don't you know it should be the government's money? Let them decide how much they want, how much you should have. Let them decide if you should even go to church. Let them decide if you should believe in God. Let them decide if your children should be educated. Listen, every decision that men make is a spiritual issue. It's a moral issue. A man's money is considered his because that's part of your life. You got $20 an hour, that's an hour of your life somebody bought from you. You traded them that. And if the government says, I want half of that, that government's stealing half of that hour of your life, you'll never get back. You need to start thinking, folks. Amen. 1639, the Constitution of the State of Connecticut says, God's word should be the only rule for ordering the affairs of government in this commonwealth. What a joke that is today. Amen. There ain't a thought that that even comes across uh, a, a nebulous Ned de Lamont's mind. Here's what it said. Uh, in the, the colony of Connecticut, 1647, as well as Massachusetts, and in one form or another, most of the other colonies. It being the one chief project of that old deluder Satan, to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures as in former time, it is therefore ordered that after the Lord hath increased the settlement to number of fifty householders, they shall forthwith appoint one within their town to teach all such children as shall resort to him to read and write. And this is further ordered that where any town shall increase to the number of one hundred families or householders, they shall set up a grammar school for the university. Why is that? The Satan should gain an advantage over us by ignorance to the word of the living God. We were wrong. Okay. The average person today, we, a, a, a group of kids came by, uh, missed it the uh, week before last, I guess it was. And they were, I don't know, teenagers maybe. And uh, I'm going to guess 14 to 16. And uh, Nice kids, very, very nice, very polite. Tell they had kind of pretty good upbringing. And uh, I asked them, "Do you know what sin is?" And one girl said, very, very proudly, but I'm not arrogant. Well, sin is distance from God. I said, "Well, that's not altogether wrong." I said, "Give me a Bible definition of sin, just one." No idea. You know what that girl thought? Some Sunday school teacher, some well-meaning person, 
said, well, you know, being lost is just being distant from God. No, it's burning in the lake of fire. That's where it's going to take you. God put his word on this world so we wouldn't have that distance to it. So that we'd be well equipped for the rest of the match of this world, this life, and all that it presents. What are you doing with it? The Bible calls Satan the God of this world, and that he has blinded the minds of them that believe in him. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. What are we doing for the lost? What are we doing to, to teach the saved? What are we doing to encourage people to draw nigh to God and study and prepare themselves, get their, get their shoes on with the gospel, not wait for the world to come in? Jesus didn't say build a nice church and invite them in. He said go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Let's stand.